Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Bradley's House, the podcast. I am your co-host, Jared Orr. She is the executive director of the Noel Family Foundation and our host, Kelly Noel. Kelly, how are you doing today? I'm wonderful. Thanks, Jared. How are you doing? Gosh, I'm happier than uh, than I can say to be here today. I'm really excited. I feel like we're always recording on holidays. I know our schedule's been crazy, so we're getting some shows in the can here, but it's Valentine's Day as we record this. I feel like we got Halloween and maybe like <laughs> Flag Day or something else in there. So we're probably uh, we're hitting we're hitting all of the holidays. So happy Valentine's Day to you, Kelly. Thank you, and to you, Jared. Now, I know that uh, you are super excited about today's episode, and you have once again lined up another amazing guest for us. Who's hanging out with us today in Bradley's house? Jarrett, I'm not going to lie. I'm a little giddy about today's guest. Um, for all of the previous episodes, you've been Mr. Fanboy, which is great. That's You were the one who came up with the idea for the podcast. You get to talk with all these people that you love and admire. They're all people that I love and admire as well, but people that I know pretty well. So it hasn't been anything, you know, overwhelming or shocking for me. Very easy, very easy interviews. But I've had the pleasure all week of completely freaking out, knowing that today we were going to be talking with someone whose music I've listened to almost daily ever since a friend introduced me to his album Tape Deck Heart back in 2013. I have a very strong connection to some of his songs, which I'll talk about later. He's seriously one of my favorite singers and songwriters. Today, we have Frank Turner with us. Frank, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank Welcome, you, Frank. So, yeah, thank you, for, thank you for having me, and thank you for a lovely, very kind introduction. Um, how, how sweet of you, and happy Valentine's Day to everybody. Thank you. Happy Valentine's Day. I, as I said, I've been listening to your music since 2013. My kids have grown up hearing it. We're all huge fans. We've probably seen you half a dozen times in concerts, saw the documentary at the Glass House in Pomona. Um, I've read your book twice. I'm seriously a super geeky fan. And and that doesn't happen to me very often. There's probably three people that I feel that way about. So it is really, truly an honor to have you on the show. And I really well, appreciate you doing I'm, it. That's absolutely my pleasure. And I'm now deeply intrigued as to who the other two people might be <laughs> and, and how I can fight them. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, uh, but yes, thank you for having me. Thank you. Really, um, really appreciate it. So one of the things that, that really struck me when I was reading through your book I, and, and that I had already known about you. So I got the book, I think it was about five years ago. And when I was originally reading through it, it there were a lot of similarities between you and my brother that I noticed. And one of the biggest is that um, you're very intelligent, well-educated, as was Brad. He was a big reader. Um, and a lot of people are surprised to hear about that. A lot of people are surprised that that he went to university and that, you know, higher education and all that kind of stuff. And and you mentioned that as well, going to Eton and that some people are surprised by that or have, you know, um, mixed feelings about that. Do you find that, especially in the punk community, that that sort of played against you sometimes? Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, it's really important for me in talking about all this kind of stuff to be aware that the um, issues that I'm talking about now on, on the list of problems that you could have in life, they rank almost at the bottom. <laughs> so like, I'm not for a minute trying to like claim any kind of like um, special trauma in my life or anything like that. But it is an interesting thing. Like I got sent to, I was probably educated on a scholarship and it was a weird experience because I wasn't a hundred percent sure what was going on when I took the exam from memory. Um, my, my mom and dad were like, do this exam. And I went, okay. Um, and then, <laughs> and then I got the scholarship and then I got shipped to boarding school and I have a vivid memory of getting dropped off and kind of going, okay. This is cool. And then my parents left and I was like, where, where did they go? Um, and then they were like, oh, they'll be, yeah, they'll be back in a month or so. And the thing is, they must have told me what was going on. I was just kind of a, a, an airheaded teenager or, well, 12 year old at the time. So um, it, I, the experience was quite traumatic. And then on uh, both in terms of getting shipped off and then um, without getting too political about it, like that whole world of private education is not really to my taste, should we say? That might be a polite way of putting it. Um, and, sure. uh, um, and and there was a kind of social milieu there of kind of like um, some quite wealthy kids. Um, uh, not I'm not from like um, a, a sort of the earth working class family. I'm solidly middle class, but like um, it was different for me. And um, I found a lot of that very challenging. And my love for punk rock kind of grew out of that. I mean, I love the music, obviously, but like the, at a moment in time when I felt very kind of stranded, um, and very confused and very angry about the world, I discovered, you know, Black Flag, um, and The Clash. And it was like, <laughs> oh, okay, I get it. Now this is, this is the solution to all of my troubles. Um, sure. and then moving on in life, I'm sorry, this is a long answer to a short question. Um, moving, moving forward in life, like it's been, 
it does occasionally get a little frustrating because it wasn't an act of volition on my part. I didn't choose to be educated there, you know, and I, and I firmly believe that any judgments that we make about other people should be made on the things that they choose to do freely rather than on things that happen to them or things that they can't. Absolutely. Right. Um, and uh, it's a funny old thing. Like, <clears throat> you know, I arguably chose pretty much the only walk of life in which where I went to school as a hindrance rather than a help. Um <laughs> That's not the reason that I chose it, but like it has been interesting to me that like, you know, there I'm sure that I've missed out on opportunities once people have discovered where I went to school. It, it's much more heated in the UK than it than you guys I think could imagine. Um, the kind of like class consciousness and that kind of thing. And and like I get it, I understand. There's 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 huge privileges to privilege to be dealt with, and there's huge inequality and all that kind of thing. And I'm not in favour of any of that kind of thing. Um, and you know, I had a lot of head starts in life, and, I, and I'm grateful for those. But it, it it can occasionally get a little frustrating um, to me, uh, sort of constantly being kind of ripped on for it. And it's kind of like I didn't choose to be this, um, <laughs> you know. And what I'm trying to do once I came out of the process of becoming my own individual person is something else. You know what I mean? I didn't go into the traditional careers that people from my school tend to go into. Which I love because I do think that, as you mentioned, people tend to judge us based on the things that happened to us when we were kids that we really had no control over. And right. it's, it should be about the choices that you make in the direction that you exactly. go with your life. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, I mentioned reading your autobiography, which I highly recommend to anybody. It's not, not only a great autobiography, but just a great story about life on the road and, and the development of a musical career. It's called The Road Beneath My Feet for anybody listening who wants to check it out. Really great. And of course, the song title comes from, or I mean, the, the book title comes from your song, The Road. Yeah. Um, you mentioned in that song, only being shackled to the road will ever I be free, which is such a great dichotomy. But how are you handling not touring in this age of COVID? <laughs> it's, uh, it's a misery. Um, I mean, it's, a, it's you know, uh, again, like in the grand scheme of like issues that people have to deal with in the world, I'm aware that I'm, I'm near the bottom and I'm not. I, I, <laughs> I, 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 but I, I, in seriousness, do you know what I mean? Like there are a lot of people who sure. have it much, much harder than me right now and I don't want to complain. Um, it's been a strange time. I mean, you know, it's, it's like somebody found the off switch to my life and pressed it in March last mm. year. I was actually on tour when the lockdown kicked in over here in the UK. And um, it, it was weird. We sort of all knew it was coming. And we had this very strange week where with every passing day, it was like clearer that things were going to shut down. And people started saying, oh, you should cancel the shows. And I was like, I hate canceling shows. I'm not going to do that. Right. But then, But then you don't want to be part of the problem. You don't want to be you don't want to be making the world worse or making people be at risk or whatever. And exactly. eventually, we, you know, we, we pulled the last five shows of the tour, which was galling. Although, I mean, this is the thing I think a lot of people forget now. Like back in March 2020 in the UK, they were all saying the lockdown would be three weeks. So right. I was thinking, well, it's a pain in the ass, but I'll just rearrange shows in the summer or whatever. And here we are. <laughs> a year later Crazy. um and no joy i mean it's funny cuz like obviously you know it's been a financial hardship for me um i've lost 95% of my income life goes on uh, you know i i've been, i've been comfortable in previous years um and to find myself in a place where i'm not allowed to do that anymore it's been rough in in a number of different ways it's been unusual some parts of it have been nice actually i've definitely spent more time with my wife in the last year than i had in all of the previous time we'd known each other put together and I'm it sure. turns out that we get on quite well um which <laughs> well is, that's good yeah it's a relief right um uh but you know so th there's definitely been plus points to it and positive moments and all kind of thing but one of the main things for me like i say is the sense of identity like i'm not entirely i, I i've spent a lot of the last year trying to figure out who exactly i am if i'm not the person who tours all the time Mm. Yeah, it's very redefining, isn't it? Yeah. Well, and you know, it's a funny thing. I, I have this kind of theory that most people, and I don't know, you might disagree with this vociferously, but like most people in the previous years, in previous decades, whatever, there's a little part of you that's sort of like secretly hoping for some kind of like calamity to make you <laughs> something dramatic. Do you know what I mean? Like you wouldn't necessarily say it out loud, but secretly you're kind of like, "Ooh, that would be interesting and exciting and different, if nothing else." And now that we've all experienced it, we're all like, "God damn it, no!" Right? Like, I, I take it all back. I'm an idiot. I should never exactly. have said that. Um, Forget and, it. We were fine. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I had a funny old thing. Like, I genuinely had been toying about a year ago, a little bit more, with the idea of taking a year off the road. Almost to just kind of like, as it, because I've been just touring so constantly for more than two decades, more, right. than, more than half my life. And it was like, 
what if I took a year off and I had all these ideas about, you know, go and live in Paris for a year or something. And, and if nothing else, like, you know, to sort of generate new things to write songs about and blah, blah, blah. Um, and uh, I've now taken a year off the road and it's awful and I'll never do it again. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Over it. Well, you do mention, um, you know, in your book, the, the benefits of playing the smaller shows and the bigger shows and getting the different feels for it and that kind of thing. Mm. And you have toured so much, which I love about the book that you name off the number of each tour, you know, <laughs> we're getting up yeah, to yeah. number, you know, 428. And it's like, good grief, that man never stops. <laughs> but between, you know, the touring you did with, with the first band that was really big, Million Dead, mm. uh, which was a, a post-core, right? Kind of post-core. Uh, yeah, kind, kind of like, I mean, I, I've, I've got into the lazy habit of referring to us as a punk band, which um, if you were the kind of person who had nothing better to do, you could argue the toss about. But like, philosophically, we were a punk band. Yeah. And then moving into having a solo career, that must have mm. been a huge difference. Yeah, it was a big change. Um, it, it, I mean, it's a funny old thing. Like, it, it was it was in 2005, so 16 years ago now, and and... With every passing year, it increasingly feels like it happened to somebody else. You know what I mean? I find sure. I find myself quite disassociated from things that happened that long ago. It's one of the things that's weird is that when when I I took the decision to try playing solo shows with just me and my piece of guitar when my band broke up, and at the time everybody and I do mean everybody thought that I was completely out of my mind, um, yeah. and I thought that I had a plan, and now. Everybody looks back on that and thinks that I must have had a plan, and I look back and think I must have been out of my mind <laughs> because it doesn't make any sense. I like we, everyone's changed places, like, and, and right. there wasn't there wasn't really like an overarching plan at the time. And one thing I'm kind of proud of is that it was a very kind of pure artistic decision in the sense that it wasn't a route to more commercial success, and it wasn't you know because I had this big record deal waiting for me if I did that or anything like that. It's just like I want to make this kind of music now, and all my friends and the record labels I worked with and all this kind of thing all kind of were like, what are you smoking? And I said, no, no, this is, this is what I want to do. I think that's wonderful. There were some um, shows that Brad would play solo acoustic mm. and those tend to be some, some fan favorites as far as the recordings right. and that kind of thing, yeah. because they're so raw and personal, you know, right. very different vibe. Exactly. But that must've been hard to get used to. Absolutely. Like, I mean, and I wouldn't for a second say that I think that my early solo shows, and there are a few recordings out there were particularly good. Um, like, because there's, it's such a huge change of format. And like, one of the things I learned straight away is that you, you are, you're so exposed. Like, you can't, if something, if something goes amiss in the show, you can't like just kind of have a noise jam for a bit and then blame the drummer. Right. I mean? it's, like, <laughs> it's just you. Uh, and like, and, and, and indeed, like, you know, there's a lot of music out there and some of which I love, but it's sort of, it's like, it's the content is all, the, the, the form is almost as important as the content. Do you know what I mean? It's like a lot of kind of like techie metal bands, for example. And I love a lot of that stuff, but it's like, as long as it's at 9 million miles an hour and it's in 13, eight and all the rest of it, then it is already what it is going to be. And if it's just you and a guitar, it's like all of the focus is on the song. Is it a good song? Is it a bad song? And there's nothing to hide behind. You can't kind of go, well, I guess you didn't like like the song, but did you like the guitar solo? Did you like? The, <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you know what I mean? It's like it's just the song. There's nothing else, and and there's something quite um, naked about that, which I I found challenging, but I kind of chose it with open eyes. I knew it was going to be a challenge, and I enjoyed the fact that it was going to be a challenge, and I wanted to see if I could rise to it. That's wonderful. Well, obviously, it was it was a good choice, and it's nice that you have the varied experiences as well. Yeah, definitely. And these days, you know, I have my band who I tour with uh, most of the time when uh, we're able to tour, and I love them. And they're my they're my own personal E Street band, and they're they're awesome, uh, the Sleeping Souls. And but I still do solo shows as well, and it's nice to be able to choose. Yeah. Now I will say that every time you've been in Southern California and we've seen you, you've been with the Sleeping Souls. Hmm. So I have yet to see a solo acoustic show, but oh, one of really? these days. Oh, that is a it shame. Will happen. I, we it will, will happen. Yeah, we will have to we will have to do something about that. <laughs> Absolutely. So we talk a lot about musical influences on this show because obviously we hmm. talk a lot about Sublime and they had very um diverse musical influences. Sure. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about yours. I think you, you if I my memory serves, I think Iron Maiden was your first album you ever bought. <laughs> <laughs> that is correct. Yes, um, that's excellent research. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I loved Iron Maiden when I was a kid. Um, I mean, metal was my first love, and then because my parents didn't listen to anything uh, uh, modern at all, they listened to classical music and church music, and so I kind of um, I got into uh, to the metal kind of accidentally and fell in love with it. And then, and then nice. I, I I feel like of that era of kind of of skate punk, pop punk, whatever you want to call it. Um, like for every 10 kids in the UK who got into Smash and Dookie, 
like two of them would go and find out who no effects and descendants were <laughs> and then right. one of them would get to black flag and it's not there's <laughs> there's no there's no like kind of that's like, accurate <clears throat> superiority in that it was just there was this kind of natural filtration process down from something that was very kind of fashionable uh, I mean, festival, popular, let's say. Um, but yeah, so, and then I, I entered this kind of extremely long and torrid love affair with punk rock, which is ongoing. Um, and, you know, and then, it, but it was strange. I've reached a point, at the point that we were just discussing where I started playing solo shows. I was in my uh, mid-twenties, let's say, and I could have recited you the entire Sick of It All discography with my eyes closed, and I'd never heard mm. a single song by Bob Dylan. Um, wow. and, and then I started listening to Bob Dylan and I started listening to Springsteen and Loudon Wainwright and Johnny Cash and Josh Rouse and just a lot of kind of like, um, singer songwriters, country, folk, whatever you want to call it. And, and, um, kind of discovering that there were other ways to be intense other than just like taking a shirt off and shaving your head and shouting at people. Um, <laughs> and that was really quite eye opening for me. It was like, oh wow, this is, I mean, like, John, it's an obvious thing to choose, but like Johnny Cash's cover of Hurt, for example, I think is way heavier than anything Slayer ever recorded. And I say that as a big Slayer fan. Um, uh, and you know, Springsteen's Nebraska was a huge record for me. And that just the idea that you could be intense, you could be meaningful, you could be profound was huge for me. And, and so since then, I mean, I still listen to a lot of punk rock, but I listen to a lot of kind of folk and country too. And, um, a lot of kind of like sort of, the the more kind of wordy end of indie rock, should we say, stuff like, you know, Mountain Goats and Hold Steady and Weaker Vans, um, The Nashville, that kind of thing, I love. Um, and then I love a lot of Motown. I love a lot of um, Sam Cooke and uh, I love Nina Simone, um, that kind of thing. So mm. it's it's hopefully it's varied. I mean, we should all strive for that, surely. Yeah, I agree. I think it adds a lot of depth to music when, when there's multiple influences mm. and Always been Absolutely. a big fan, yeah, of all different kinds of music, and I—that's I, how I raised my kids as well. You know, we'd mm. we'd hear a little snippet of something in a song that would remind me of something from Run DMC, and then I go and grab the album and make them listen to it, and Amazing. you know, talk about how that's the roots of all these other things, and yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a lot of fun. See, I don't, so, I don't, I don't have children as yet, and um, uh, if that ever becomes a thing, I'm going to be like the most like awful parent in the sense that I'm going to like, I'm going to, I've got this like, plan to like structure my children's listing by like, okay, you know, 0 to 5 with the Gregorian chants, like medieval plain song, 5 to 10 will sort of engage with the classical canon. And they're probably allowed to listen to the Beatles when they're like 12, maybe. And, and then, you know, we'll sort of, we'll, we'll catch up to the modern era by the time they're 30. I don't know, right, maybe. Know, and it'll just be chronological, you know? Somewhere around there. Yeah. I yeah. will say that we we did. I homeschooled my kids, so we did cover Gregorian chants at one time. Oh wow! Okay, but, nice. <laughs> <laughs> you nailed it. But um, one thing I I was struck with when reading your book is all the different places that you went early on in your career. Mm. When when Brad first started touring, you know they'd go to up north to San Francisco or to Portland, Oregon, or over to Texas, and that seems super exotic. Whereas you were going to places like Latvia, which mm. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Seems incredibly exotic and, it, and quite memorable. Yes, I mean, definitely memorable. I mean, it's worth pointing out that the distance between London and Riga and Latvia is not that much further than the distance between Southern California and Seattle. You know, like, you guys live in an enormous country, um, and it's something that is difficult to appreciate as an English person until you actually get there. Um, funnily enough, Facebook memories threw a thing up at me the other day. It was, a, I think it was, hold on, yeah, it was 11 years ago this week. I drove with a friend from... Santa Barbara to Austin. And oh I just my. remember being in a van full of equipment. I just remember kind of being in the van, kind of going, how can there be any more Texas? Like, <laughs> we have had enough Texas. I love Texas. I have a Texas. It's never too, ending. It was, it was just like, it, and uh, I, on a very early tour I did, I fell asleep in the van as we drove overnight. Um, from, in fact, we were driving the other way on the same road. So we drove from Austin to Phoenix. And I fell asleep after the show in the back seat of the van. And I woke up eight hours later and we were still in Texas and it was just like, <laughs> God damn it. I tried to sleep through this. Um, but <laughs> can't do it. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's, you guys have an enormous country anyway. I mean, yeah, I, I, first of all, I sort of just took the view that I would play anywhere really. And I, and I still do. Um, and one of the great privileges that I have in my career is that I've been all around the world. Um, you know, I've never been to America except for through the medium of music, you know, um, no. it's, it's always been my reason for going there, and that's a wonderful thing. And I've been all around Europe, and I've been to Australia, and New Zealand, and 
Um, I've been to Vietnam and Russia and Israel and China and you know and it's and, and a lot of the time though but it's it's really useful that I can tour with just me and my guitar because a lot of these shows sure. would never never happen if it was trying to get four people in like the first time I toured China was a sort of illegal is too strong a word but kind of unauthorized might be the word like I didn't mm -hmm. really have a performance visa um, but my name and my passport is Francis rather than Frank and they just kind of let me in because nobody checked <laughs> nice <laughs> and then i played a bunch of like squat shows in like former nuclear bunkers and wow. it was just crazy crazy experience um so you know I'm, and, and and indeed like russ is a funny one most people russ is pretty heavy as a country I, I love it but like you know a lot of people a lot of my friends who in bigger bands who've been there on sort of more official tours um you know you you have a minder and you have guides and you stay in a kind of english language hotel and it's very kind of regimented out of necessity, because it can be quite a sketchy country. Um, the first, every time I've been to Russia, actually, like I've slept on the floor of a tower block apartment that was owned by the punk dude whose show I was playing in like some dive bar or squat or whatever nice. it might be. And I just sort of, you know, I feel fortunate that I've been able to see like more of Russia in that way than, than perhaps some of my other friends have seen. Yeah. And how is that going from playing the smaller venues to playing the bigger shows? Um, you know, there's some differences. I mean, first of all, it's great in terms of your ego. Um, <laughs> it's nice to, <laughs> sure. nice to stand in front of a lot of people that makes you feel like you've achieved something with your life. Um, I mean, there are some technical differences to it. Um, in terms of the way you present what you do and the kind of, um, I mean, th to pick a, a, a pertinent example, you have to talk more slowly on stage in a big room because the sound echoes around the place. And the way that I used to natter away on stage oh, yeah. in a bar with 50 people in, if you talk like that on stage in an arena, nobody's going to get a single word of what you're talking about. So it's little things like that. But like, I do remember um, when I got to the point of playing my first arena show, which was an arena headline show at Wembley Arena back in 2012, like in the run up to the, we booked the show, which was crazy enough in itself. Do you know what I mean? It was like, I've got a headline in the arena. Somebody called the reality police. There's been a mistake. Um, but I just kind of remember <laughs> thinking to myself, like, Oh, well, I have to present everything I do really differently. I have to completely throw my set list out the window and, and, and just start from scratch and because this is a whole different thing. And I went down that road philosophically for, for a month or so. And then I kind of thought to myself, what, am, what on earth am I talking about? Like the reason I got there is because of the music that I write exactly. and the shows that I play. And I don't want to change it for that. So as I say, there are technical things that you change, but I believe pretty strongly that a show is a show and that what you're trying to do is create a connection. And in a smaller room, that's arguably easier to do because the front row are like six inches away from you as opposed to like 60 feet or whatever. Sure. Um, but um, but it's still you're still trying to do the same thing. You're still trying to connect with an audience. You're still trying to entertain people. You're still trying to present your art in the best way that you can. And I think it's better to concentrate on the things they have in common than the differences. Absolutely. You know, we talk a lot about um, recovery on this podcast, obviously, since that is the reason for yeah. existing. We are yeah, in the yeah. process of raising money to build a six-bed treatment center for people in the music industry. So we have a really varied um, listenership. We have a lot of people who are, you know, fans of music and sublime. Sure. And we also have a lot of, of up-and-coming musicians who listen as well. And sure. so... I like that we have that, that nice mix, but I do always like to touch on the whole issue of recovery. And you mentioned a couple things in your book, and yes, I'm actually going to read an excerpt from the book. Oh. Uh, you said, I'm not particularly anti-drugs. Uh, I happen to believe in the complete legalization of all drugs. I don't really see how it's anybody's business but your own, both the right and the responsibility. And I think that's, uh, to me, that was an important distinction that, um, that we do all make those choices and that it is our own right, but it's also our own responsibility right. of how we behave. And you do talk a lot about that in the book too, is how, um, you know, being fucked up impacts your ability to perform. And sure, Sublime absolutely. has a lot of, a lot of very memorable performances where they could not, you know, get the songs out. Brad couldn't remember the words, that kind of thing. And, um, and I think it's, it's unfortunate. It makes for great stories, obviously, but, um, you also say later in the book, I was heading somewhere, but not without stumbling all over the track. And I think, a lot of musicians experience that same thing and get caught in a trap. You know, there's, there's a difference between a drug user and, and someone who struggles with addiction. And Absolutely. yeah, and it's, it's, I think it's important to make that distinction. You know, when you suddenly find yourself unable to control and it's impacting your life and it's impacting your music career and that kind of thing, you know, then that's when it, it's time to make, make changes. And Absolutely. You, yeah. So you talk about how, you know, you were very, um, 
liberal with your drug use. And then there were times when you backed off because you felt that it was, it was an impediment. And, um, that, I think that's an unusual thing to find where people, yeah. especially in the music industry can make that distinction. Um, but a lot of people unfortunately do get caught in, in something that they can't control, which is why we're trying yeah. to, to open Bradley's house. But you wrote a, a beautiful song called recovery that I absolutely mm -hmm. love. Thank um, you. But I'm not real clear on the, the origins of that. So at what point did you write that song? Well, uh, I see. Okay, so I have to do some clarifications here. Um, one of which is that um, actually, funnily enough, the kind of the nadir, the, the bottoming out of my uh, relationship with substance abuse it actually happened kind of since I finished writing that book. So um, I'm very pleased to say I'm in a cleaner and more healthy place now. Nice. Um, uh, but uh and, and and I think the thing is, is like, you know, for a long time, I, I definitely sort of believed in that illusion of control. And one of the biggest things I learned is that I believed for a long time that, that music was, was sufficient to be my therapy. Do you know what I mean? It's like when things were bad, it was like, well, I need to pull my shit together. I'm just going to go and listen to a whole bunch of Leonard Cohen records and then I'll be fine. <laughs> That'll do it. And, yeah. And, and, and actually, the thing that I've learned is that music is necessary, but not sufficient. And actually, what I've done in the last kind of five years, let's say, is I've been through things like CBT, um, uh, to looking at addiction issues and that kind of thing. And it's been a transformative moment in my life because it was, it was that thing that everybody has to do where you actually realize that, like, you know, I'm not in full control of this and I do not just in and of myself have the ability to solve my problems that I, I have brought upon myself. Um, the music industry can be a weirdly kind of perfect storm for substance abuse issues um, in the sense that, I mean, first of all, I've spent a lot, my entire adult life existing in an environment in which alcohol is considerably more readily available than food. Um, mm -hmm. and, and indeed, if you drink it all, someone will get you more. Um, right. and, do you know what I mean? And like, and that's just alcohol. And when you move on to the other things, it's always there if you want it. It's not hard to find. Um, and then I had that, I mean, it's cliche in many ways, but I had that thing of like, for a long time, my drug use was constrained by the fact that I wasn't very successful and therefore couldn't afford it. Right. Um, and then uh, I had this moment where suddenly it was like, not only did I have money in my bank account, but like everybody was talking to me like the sun shined out my ass anyway, because it was the <laughs> of my career when everything really blew up. Um, and then suddenly it was really easy. And instead of ordering one, you could order five, you know what I mean? And right. ten. And then, um, and then people would make excuses for you if you weren't, didn't have your shit together, at least to a degree. Um, I was lucky for a long time in the sense that the guys in my band, none of them uh, do drugs and they were, you know, they are, I do employ those guys or whatever, but they're also my friends and they have a wonderful line in passive aggressive judgment um, <laughs> in the sense that like on those occasions when I wasn't, didn't have my shit together, I would get the side eye like hard yeah. um, from my band and my crew. And that was actually pretty useful for me. Sure. Um, but yeah, I definitely reached a point where I had to do something about it and kind of make that moment of acceptance. Um, of saying I need help with this. Um, a lot of that has to do with with meeting my now wife, um, who is uh, currently training to be a doctor of counseling psychology. So she sort of knows quite a lot about that world. Anyway, um, and indeed to that wonderful thing of kind of going, this is a complete fucking joke. I'm not sticking around while you do this to yourself, um, which again was very helpful. And I'm very helpful. Grateful. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the things for me is that um, going to what you mentioned from the book about, about legalization, that kind of thing, there is all, all the drugs I got wrapped up in are very illegal in this country. Um, and it didn't stop me. Uh, do you know what I mean? In fact, it probably encouraged right. me in the sense right. that it made it seem more kind of like romantic That's and exciting. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and like, I, I had lo have long had a theory that if you had to queue in a pharmacy behind like people buying incontinence medication to get your drugs, then a lot less people would buy it, would do them. Um, I think you're right. Yeah, you know, it's just, it's like, it's, there's that glamour of being at the party and, oh, I know a guy. I've got the phone number or like, who's got the, you know what I mean? It's just that it becomes the hookup. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Who's, who's in the know? And, but so, you know, I mean, um, so anyway, moving on through all of this, um, recovery the song and indeed quite a lot of that book was written at a point in time when I was aware that there were problems in my life with this and I was doing quite a good job of pretending I could handle them all on my own um, uh, recovery was having said that I mean it was about it's a true story in the sense that I ended a long term relationship I ended it it was a terrible error but there it was it was a self imposed um, uh, storm in my personal life and um, I sort of charged out into the night and went to like a uh, this is the only time in my life I've ever done this. I went to a party that was like stuffed with kind of models 
and actors and things like this. I don't usually get invited to parties like that, and when I do, I don't go <laughs> because it's not really my thing. But on that occasion, I did, and I ended up taking a bunch of like weird experimental drugs in a warehouse party in East London, which is East London's like Williamsburg. Um, hence the mm. opening line of the song "Blacking Out" and the, "Blacking Out" <laughs> the strange flat in East London is quite pointed. Yes. You know what I mean? It's kind of like yes. that, the area in which I usually hang out, and um, and I did have this moment of kind of just sort of thinking to myself, I don't want to be this person. It was like six a.m. and I was buzzing and I was lonely, and it was just like whatever the choices that took me to this point were, they were bad ones, you know. Um, and so the song is not about getting better and and full recovery it's about that moment when you realize that you need to make changes um, right and, and accepting that you know okay th whatever this is gesticulating wildly at the world around you it's mm -hmm. a bad idea you know and i need to do something else um as i say like the song kind of implies that I, or, or at least and i may even have implied in books and in interviews and all the rest of it that i succeeded in making that change earlier than i actually did but here i am coming clean <laughs> well, to me, it was just very much a, a declaration of needing help, which mm -hmm. I think so many, you know, so many of us can relate to. And that to me was a very honest, beautiful thing. And Thank the you. time in my life when I first heard that song, I was uh, going through a horrible divorce and, you know, trying to, to rebuild my life. And so it was just, um, it was relating to that sense of desperation and of needing to make changes. Right. And I, I'm very drawn to the rawness of, of your lyrics. And, and again, that's another correlation that I can draw between you and my brother, just finding sure. that, that genuineness in what you write about. And of course, um, one that, as I mentioned in the intro, that has always just been so special to me is Long Live the Queen that you wrote about your friend Lexi dying of cancer. Yeah. And, and that's just, it's such a, a beautiful raw song that so many of us who've lost loved ones can relate to. And, and I did lose a, a very good friend about six years ago. So that was one of the songs. Thank you. One of the songs that I just couldn't listen to without crying for a very long time, but it's just, it's just so beautiful and a great example of, okay. of wonderful songwriting. Um, the very first song I ever heard of yours is still my favorite and that's four simple words, The the tempo changes and the, the passion and the, you know, the realness about, you know, bands who had to work for their keep and all that kind of stuff. It just, it spoke to me on so many different levels. And um, so when did you start getting into songwriting? When did you first start writing? Well, see, the, there's a two part answer to this. Like, I mean, I started kind of quote unquote writing songs very early. I got my, I got into Maiden when I was about 10 for my 11th birthday I got um, I got an electric guitar and an amp, um, and my best mate who lived next door to me had a drum kit, and we started kind of smashing about playing ACDC covers and Nirvana covers and stuff like that. And pretty early on, I started like, as I say, in quotes, writing songs in the sense that I would jot down some, uh, in retrospect, absolutely indefensible teenage bullshit, um, and then and then sort of like writing down kind of four random chord shapes and then playing them as bar chords and shouting. Whilst he went ba 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 on the drums, and we called it a song. I, I'm <laughs> reticent to actually call that songwriting in any meaningful way. Well, I do think that's sort of requisite to the whole songwriting process. I don't think anybody starts by sure. writing a beautiful opus. Yeah, it's kind of the primordial soup stage of songwriting, should we say? But um, it was uh, <laughs> it was it wasn't good. Um, and then, like, I mean, you know, I was in a bunch of different kind of hardcore bands, ended up in this band, Million Dead, that you mentioned. And, like, it's funny because, like, obviously we wrote songs in Million Dead. We wrote as a four-piece. We all wrote together. I wrote a lot of the guitar parts. I wrote all the lyrics. Um, we all worked on the vocal melodies and stuff. And so it was songwriting to a degree, but, like, it was still kind of, like, quite a... Um, uh, like a mechanical process there wasn't much kind of overview do you know what i mean it was just like oh that's right. cool. do that again okay cool mm. that's that that's roughly three minutes long that'll do and like <laughs> one, one one of the things that was like really um uh philosophically changed for me when i became a, a solo artist was that i started thinking about songwriting as an art form unto itself that was kind of detached from musicianship or stylistic considerations because I actually think that at the end of the day, the ABBA and No Effects have much more in common than they've even separated them. And if you look at their songwriting, um, mm. and you know, so I think that like it is, it's almost like that bit in the Matrix where you see the number. He starts seeing the numbers coming down at the end. It's like after a while, if if you you can divorce yourself from genre considerations, it doesn't matter if it's a reggae song or it's a hardcore song or it's a techno song or whatever, you can hear the song. You know, um, that's right. kind of in it, and that was the thing I started paying a lot more attention to at that point in my life, and and. So even though it's not really true, I sort of date my career as a songwriter from when I went solo. I mean, 
I, d I don't mean that to disrespect any of the music I made before then, because I'm fiercely proud of most of it. Um, but, you know, that that's when I felt like a songwriter rather than just like a dude kind of trying to make noise in a band. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, not to put you on the spot, but when I, um, my initial introduction with you was because I did a, a podcast interview with Liam Bird for Punks and Pubs, which is a mm. great UK okay. podcast. And uh, before I did the show, I looked to see, you know, who, who, previous guests that he had and, and when I saw your name, I was like, oh, my gosh, this is really amazing. So I was talking about that with Liam, and he said, well, I'll send an email of introduction, and which he did. And so, you know, yeah. when you happened to respond and, and, you know, say that you thought Brad was a great artist, and uh, that yeah, was incredibly gratifying. Um, but here's the part where I don't want to put you on the spot. But uh, you mentioned Nirvana, so obviously you were listening to a similar type genre of music. Mm. Um were you ever listening to Sublime? Was that something that was part oh, of yeah, your repertoire? Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, it was. Uh, I mean this in the best possible way. It was inescapable in this in the circle of <laughs> movement um, uh, at that period of my life. It was like, I mean, you know, there were we're, we're talking about um, a, a particular moment in music history, but it was like if you were the kind of kid who wore like baggy jeans and a wallet chain, then you were going to be familiar with the following set of bands. You know what I mean? Right. And now, <laughs> <laughs> on, on top of that, I mean, yeah, I was a fan. It's, it's, it's fantastic music. It's, it's wonderful, wonderful tunes. And, and, it, and it's definitely like anchored in a certain time and place in my life. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I have huge respect for it. That question was super self-serving because after <laughs> shortly after Brad died, I was watching an interview on TV with Pat Benatar and um, she was asked what her what kind of music her kids listen to. And she mentioned Sublime and um, I just about fell out of my chair because Brad and I grew up listening to Pat Benatar. So for yeah, yeah. her kids to be listening to Brad's music was just, it just, it was hard for me to wrap my brain around. So yeah. um it well, makes, you see, I'm very happy to think that you were too. Yeah, definitely. I mean, kids, kids can be a wonderful conduit. Um, uh, I, one of my sort of um, breakthrough tours in the states was opening for Social Distortion for a very long right, time. Right, um, right. Who, who, who I love. I grew up listening to Social D. But the reason wonderful. I got that tour is that Mike Ness's son was a fan of mine, and Mike <laughs> says. He walked past his son's bedroom and for the first time ever heard music that it didn't make him want to stab himself in the eyes. Nice. Um, and, and like knocked on the door and said to his son, like, what is this? And his son said, oh, it's Frank Turner. And he went, oh, okay, actually, that's pretty cool. And then discovered that we were both signed to Epitaph Records at the time. Right. Um, and, and so on. And it went from there. And Mike's been an absolute diamond for me in my career and I love him to pieces but it was I, I I've met his son once or twice and I was a bit like I need to buy this guy a beer he's not old enough <laughs> yet, but, like, <laughs> soon soon yeah, soon, soon. One, I mean he probably is now thinking about it but like he wasn't at the time uh, so I have been monopolizing this conversation and I need to apologize to my co-host because it really is supposed to be <laughs> a joint effort but I think he kind of knew that that was kind of the way it was going to go Jarrett did you have any questions you wanted to ask of Frank I'm I'm just having a lot of fun listening to this, and, uh, and I'm I'm just in awe of you, Kelly. You 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 do such an amazing job, and I know how excited you were going into this. One thing that definitely uh, caught my ear, Frank, was I think that the UK is so well known for their music scene, and to hear you say that you know you were digging into bands like Green Day and Bob Dylan and Bruce Springsteen. Were they something that was, I mean, are they as popular in, in England as they are over here? Are they a mainstream everyday type thing? Or were you kind of digging into something that you weren't as exposed to being from the other side of the pond? Um, I, well, there are differences, I think. And like the, the first thing to say is that the grass is always greener like seriously and and one of the things i i've found that is quite weird like i'm a fan of the clash um i actually know some of joe's family i, I never met him which is a great sadness but you know i he was a great artist and i love his music but like no one in england holds joe strummer in the regard that he is held in america by american punks and like i got to the states and everyone was like saint joe strummer and it was like really um not not in a bad way <laughs> but it was just like Oh, and like, yeah, and, and, and similarly with a lot of stuff like, you know, whether it's Elvis Costello or Billy Bragg or whatever, like there, there's, there's this kind of anglophilia in certain parts of the American punk scene, which has been great for my career because like a lot of American people latch onto what I do for that reason. And that's cool. I mean, to answer your question more specifically, like, I mean, I think Green Day are probably the same size by size of the Atlantic. Like they are enormous kind of mainstream band. Um, and mm -hmm. with all respect, I've toured with them. They're wonderful, wonderful people. I love them very much. But um, the um, Springsteen's an interesting one because like Springsteen is definitely big in the UK and no mistake, but it's not quite the same um, because he is kind of the patron saint of the American working man or the American underclass or however you want to put it. 
Um, and there's a lot of kind of resonance in his writing, which doesn't translate as easily over here. And for me, like as a kid, I had no interest in Springsteen at all because my only exposure to him was a pair of fucking blue jeans and an American flag and all the rest of it on the on the front of an album. And I just thought, fuck that. Um, and I just wasn't <laughs> um, and and I think I'd only heard like one song, you know, Born in the USA, maybe maybe Dancing in the Dark as well. And I just just had no interest in it at all as a, as a snotty little punk kid. Um, but then, you know, somebody played me Nebraska and I was like, what the fuck is this? And, you know, then, then I realized there was more depth to it. And then once I started getting to know America to the extent that I do, having toured there many times, you know, there's a lot about, a lot of the resonances in his writing become, they make a lot more sense. Do you know what I mean? It's like, oh, I get it. Like, I understand what New Jersey is now. Um, <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> um, you know, so no, you don't. No, not until you've been there. You don't. You don't understand. Oh, I've been there, but you see, I've been there many, many, many times. I, oh well, good. I, then you do know. Yeah, I've spent a lot of time in Asbury Park actually, because there's a great punk scene there. Um, so yes, I, I, I love it dearly. But but so uh, there are definitely differences like this. I mean, it's funny because for me, uh, more specifically in terms of my own experience, like it's one of the things. So the American like hardcore scene. Um, and, you know, with Black Flag, Dead Kennedys, Bad Brains, Minor Threat, all that kind of thing. Um, that's really underground over here. Like, very few people really know what that is in the UK. And certainly as a kid, um, I would tell people that I was into hardcore and they would think I, there was a brand of techno that was called hardcore over here. And they'd think I was either into that or into pornography. Um, and it was like, I mean, <laughs> maybe. No, but... <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, it was like... Um, and And for me, like... One of the reasons I fell so hard in love with the corners of the punch scene that I did, and this is a very common thing for young people or whatever, is it felt like my secret. I found it. Do you know what I mean? And like, I was that much of a nerd that I was subscribing to mail order catalogs from hardcore distros in like Louisville, Kentucky, crank records. I was buying everything from an industry. Wow. Records. Um, no idea records. And like, I, the only other person I knew who knew what any of this was was my best mate, and we got into it together. And it was this, you know, I, I, my, my heroes were like hot water music, you know, and I had a poster of hot water music that I was actually just the back page of a record catalog with a live photo that I cut out and put in a frame. Nice. I like that. I like that a lot. Now, at what age did you, and I'm sure Kelly knows this from reading your book, but I'm listening to it. <laughs> at, at what age did you really start? You said you, you got a guitar and your, your friend got a drum set and you guys started playing around, but what age did you realize, I'm going to do this for a living? Uh, did you have that moment where it was like, this is what I'm going to do? Well, the, that's a well-phrased question. Um, I mean, the thing is, like, when I, when I fell in love with my mate and then I got a guitar and me and my mate play drums together. Obviously, we were going to be the next Iron Maiden. I mean, that was, this was just a given. We were going to play the shows that we had on VHS tapes of ACDC and Iron Maiden and all the rest of it. And this was what we wanted to do. And uh, we didn't think about it much more because we were 11 or whatever, you know, and there was no kind of meaningful analysis <laughs> of what it was actually required to play Monsters of Rock Festival or whatever it might be. Um, and then, like, you know, so it's always, I guess my point is, it's always been what I wanted to do with my life, but my realistic appraisal of what that would be has shifted over time. Um, I went through a long period of time in my late teens and early 20s, which I'm grateful for of being actively involved in the underground hardcore scene, such as it was in the UK. It was very small, but it was there. And at that point, I was like militantly DIY, um, you know, and it was like all squat shows and it was like... Um, Never pay more than three pounds, and it's just you know, no record labels, no press, no radio, just like keep it all to ourselves, and that kind of thing. Um, and I think I wanted to be kind of a squat living anarchist for the rest of my life, and the, and 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 not engage with the sort of surface part of the music industry ever. Um, and then I grew up a bit more, <laughs> um, and you know, realized that I'm interested in communication. Um, in terms of like, I mean, it, it's a funny old thing, like the, that question about because making a living out of it. I mean, I started making a living out of playing music in about 2004, 2005, but that was facilitated by the fact that I moved out of where I was living and sold everything I owned. Um, so I didn't have any <laughs> overheads. Um, and therefore, yeah, definitely. I lived on a sofa in a bar for quite a long time, um, uh, which was awful in many ways <laughs> um but it wasn't super glamorous no i didn't ever <laughs> sleep basically and in fact th this is a, a, a sideline part of why i ended up touring so much in those early days is because when i wasn't on tour that's where i had to sleep so it was like book more shows 
um, uh, to, to, to avoid that, <laughs> yeah, that, that rat yeah. infested hallway. Um, uh, so, you know, I, but, and then since then it's kind of gone along. I mean, it's a funny old, it's, it's funny, like, um, I mean, I, and I actually think that anybody who's kind of intelligent in the music industry at least has an awareness of how fickle it can be and has kind of plan B's and, 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 you know, just sort of structures in place for when you become less popular. Um, because it happens to most people at some point. So, you know, I, I still, I'm not sure that I wake up every single day just comfortably going, yes, I'm a musician and I will be forever. I hope so. That'd be lovely. I'd be very in favor of that. But, um, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll reserve judgment for a little while yet. I do feel like you're sort of on track well, to do that time. for what it's worth. And, and very encouraging. <laughs> well, I have to say, you even mention in your book that it's not always a good idea to meet your idols, but you have been absolutely lovely and absolutely did not disappoint. Thank you so much for spending this time with us, Frank. It really means a lot to me personally, and I know it'll speak Thank to a lot of people I, on the it's show. It's an honor to be part of it, really. Thank you for inviting me. Well, Kelly, another awesome chat and interview with one of your favorite musicians. And I'll tell you, I'm amazed at how awesome you did because I know you were so anxious and excited coming into this chat with Frank. And uh, I think you, you did an awesome job. How was it? Thank you, Jared. You're being generous by saying anxious and excited. I was nervous as fuck. I was so nervous all week. And I don't usually really get that way, but I just was worried about sounding stupid. And um, so hopefully I didn't because I really respect Frank so much as an artist. And and he was so cool. I was really impressed with how cool he was and how laid back and he made it easy for us. He's got that awesome English accent, so I feel like we both sounded stupid no matter what. I think if you have that English <laughs> accent, you just sound a little bit smarter than whoever you're having the conversation you're having with. But Why is that? <laughs> it's just, I don't know. There's just something about it. It just puts you in a trance. Yeah. And uh, yeah. yeah, he, he told some great right. stories, and uh, it was awesome to have somebody kind of from a, a similar genre of music, but also so different than what yeah. we've had previously. And, uh, and I thought it was really yeah. cool. So thank you for setting that up for us sure. and the listeners and, and getting yeah, and a great question. I hope anyone who is not familiar with his music will check it out. I know obviously he's got a lot of fans over here in the U.S., but if you haven't, definitely check him out. He's folk punk, which is a, just a great combination. And um, and really, he's he's branched into other areas of, of folk music and stuff too recently. But just so much great stuff in his catalog. And I definitely recommend the book to anybody, The Road Beneath My Feet. It's just a fantastic autobiography. It's a fantastic example of building a music career and the nitty gritty and the the fun and the the downsides and all of that. So it's it's really a great read. Yeah, I uh, I haven't checked it out, but I'm I'm always looking for a good. You said this comes in audio form, right? This book. I did. Yes, I've read it in in an actual book form, and I've listened to it on audiobook. And he does the reading on the audiobook, which just makes it that much better. <sighs> Shit, sold American. <laughs> Um, I am in on that. So, uh, yeah, another incredible uh, chat. And again, I can't thank you enough for setting that up. It was it was a lot of fun. And I got to kind of sit back and listen to you be so excited to chat with one of your favorite musicians. And he had some uh, some cool stories and some really great insight into how he got started in the business. Yeah, definitely a standout moment for me. It was great. A lot of fun. Guys, those of you that are listening, don't forget about our friends over at HumbleCollectiveCBD.com. Sarah has that code SUBLIME set up to save 25%. Um, the supporters of the show and the foundation really mean so much to, to what we're doing. And uh, I know that the last few weeks and episodes, Kelly, uh, you've uh, mentioned a few other companies that have kind of helped out the foundation along the road. And I I think there's a few more that you want to mention today, right? There are. The couple that I would like to mention today are local, but I know there's a lot of people listening to the podcast that are here in the Southern California area. So I want to make sure you know about a couple of great businesses that are owned not only by music lovers, but um, by veterans as well, which I think is so important to support those businesses. One of them is the Switchboard Restaurant down in Oceanside in San Diego County. They do Hawaiian 
food that is to die for. And their owner, Kevin, is just a phenomenal human being. He does everything. I swear, he must have like 36 hours in his days because the man does everything. He is a fire captain up in LA. He is a business owner. He puts on shows. He is helping us looking into grants and stuff. He's just, and he's just a phenomenal human being and a husband and a father and all these wonderful things. So, I highly recommend if you are anywhere in the Southern California area and you want a phenomenal meal that you will always remember, head down to the Switchboard Restaurant in Oceanside. Another fabulous San Diego County business that I want to make sure everybody knows about is Muffin But Good Vibes. And they are just the coolest. They go to different shows and and they donate a portion of their profits to charity. So they're very focused on on the music community, on helping other people, and as I mentioned, veteran owned. So definitely check out Muffin But Good Vibes as well. Well, it's awesome to be able to spotlight these businesses that have meant so much to the Noel Family Foundation. If you guys are local to Southern California, check out some of these businesses that Kelly's talking about because they really have been a big uh, help of the foundation and supporting the sponsors and supporting the people that support the foundation is uh, another way to support the show and Bradley's house. So uh, we're going to include some links to their businesses in the description of the show. You can go ahead and find those. And uh, again, if you hear Kelly on here talking about them, you know they're a good company. Go ahead and check them out. And uh, we thank them for all of their help. Now, speaking of supporters of the podcast, Kelly, um, I got a message this week from a listener, um, somebody who I actually became friends with um, through social media. And he's uh, done some donating to the foundation as well. And uh, his name is Mo. And uh, I want to share a message that Mo sent me with you right now, if you don't mind. Sounds great. Mo said, just wanted to say thank you to you and the Noel family for Bradley's House podcast. I lost my uncle suddenly this weekend, and I was listening to the podcast to clear my mind and just be out of my own head. He was a great person and a role model for me. And when Kelly closed the podcast out with Close to Me, on Ballyhoo. I sobbed like a baby, and honestly, it was what I needed at that moment. I have been listening to the song daily, and it has helped me process my grief in a healthy manner through music. Not a PSA here, just an honest thank you for everything that you all are doing. What an awesome message to receive, and I send uh, my condolences out to Mo and his family, but it's just great to know that the podcast is helping some people out. Definitely. Wow. And I can so relate to his, his feeling about that. So thank you for sharing that, Mo. That was, that was, it's a powerful song. And, um, I'm telling you, there's just something about heartfelt lyrics that really touch people in a very different way and, and have a lasting impact. So I'm really glad that, that Bally Who's Song could do that for Mo as well. Yeah, absolutely. And for our listeners out there, um, Mo and his wife right now are uh, are going through some steps to try to have their first child. And it hasn't been the easiest run for them, but they're doing everything that they have to do, seeing all the right doctors. So if you could send out some positive vibes, prayers, love, good thoughts, whatever works for you, uh, him and his wife uh, certainly are accepting them right now as they are uh, working on having their, their first child. Very exciting stuff. Yeah. So good luck to you, Mo. And thank you so much for being a supporter of the show and the foundation. And again, we send, uh, we send our love on the loss of your uncle. That's, uh, that's horrible, but, yeah. uh, I'm happy that the show was able to be there for you to, to get away from that just a little bit. Yeah. Okay. So Kelly, we've got a, uh, a ton of stuff that's still coming up. Uh, we just got done with the day of giving. Um, with Bradley's house that they did on Brad's birthday. That was uh, yes. an awesome event. Um, so the live stream concert. Yeah, yeah, it's just so much cool stuff that's going on and so much more stuff that you guys are, are working on. And I know with COVID, it's, it's really been difficult to be as involved as the, the foundation would like to, but you guys keep finding new ways. And, uh, and as fans, we certainly are appreciative of it. You know, it, we're just so grateful for everybody who gives so much of their their time and their resources, and and we recognize that it's really all in tribute to Bradley and to Sublime, and so we really appreciate everybody for doing all that. It, it means a lot. Absolutely. Now, Kelly, to continue with the tradition, we're going to close out the show with a song. Now, if I usually ask our guest to pick out a Sublime song that they would share with their friends if they were sharing it, so... I'm going to ask you, 
pick out a Frank Turner song that you want to share with all of our listeners to let them know who he is if they are maybe not familiar and tell us what song they're going to be hearing. There were several that I was sort of torn about ending this show with. Uh, there's my favorite, Four Simple Words. There's Substitute, which is such a great song. Um, there's Recovery. There's so many good ones to choose from. But um, I really, I think that we need to end with Ballad of Me and My Friends from the album Campfire Punk Rock because it was, it's the way that they've ended many of their shows and it just feels like the right way to end our show. So this is Ballad of Me and My Friends by Frank Turner. Awesome. Guys, we thank you so much for joining us once again. Don't forget to visit the org. Pick yourself up a hoodie, a hat, a t-shirt, send one for a gift. Friends love them. Of course, you can make donations towards Bradley's House right there. Um, you can follow the Bradley's House page on Facebook, or you can follow them on Instagram. Uh, there's the Noel Family Foundation on all social media platforms. There's tons of places that you guys can keep up on all the things that are going on. But until next time, I'm Jared Orr. She's Kelly Noel. You guys don't have to go home, but it's time to leave Bradley's house. Everybody's got themselves a plan And everybody thinks they'll be the man Including the girls, the musicians Lack the friends to form a band The singer-songwriters The rest of us are DJs Or official club photographers And tonight I'm playing another Nabooka show So I'm going through my phone book Texting everyone I know Come along anyway You never really know None of this is going anywhere Pretty soon we'll all be old And no one left alive Will really care about our glory days when we sold our souls But if you're all about the destination Then take a fucking flight We're going nowhere slowly But we're seeing all the sights And we're definitely going to hell But we'll have all the best stories to tell Yes, I'm definitely going to hell But I'll have all the best stories to tell Hello, my name is Tyson with the Null Family Foundation and I wanted to provide some resources to any men and women that need help and are struggling with drug and alcohol abuse. The first one I want to give is the SAMHSA.gov website and that is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration website. And their 1-800 number is 1-800-662-HELP. That's 1-800-662-4357. And you can always personally reach out to myself. My name is Tyson Sullivan. And you can email me at info at the org. I have a lot of resources throughout the whole country and I can help you get connected for yourself or a loved one that's struggling.